brother seemed to me to be a very wise and knowledgeable man. He always had an answer to my many questions. He didn't speak English, and I never saw him read a book. But I was sure that he had been taught by the finest of teachers and earned a diploma of a high degree. Then one day I asked him who his favorite teacher was. He said the animals. This baffled me, so I of course asked where he went to school. His reply was on the land. This puzzled me even more, so I in turn asked him, how can you go to school on the land? In his response, he explained how the Great Spirit put us on the earth and about the mother-child relationship which exists between us and the earth. He talked about how we are to live off the land and that the earth is to provide for our food, shelter, clothing, and other necessities, just like a mother would for her children. Grandfather talked about how we are to learn from Mother Earth, just as a child would learn from its mother. He went on to explain how we can learn to survive and live in harmony by observing the animals and adapting what we learn from them. He talked about needing to know the interaction which takes place within nature and the characteristics and habits of the various life forms in order to meet our basic needs for survival. Grandfather spoke about when he was a young person and how he learned to survive off the land and the importance of living in harmony. It is in this manner that Grandfather rationalized that the land was his classroom and the animals were his teachers. Since my early childhood, I have heard many elders, Cree, Dene, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota, speak on this subject. All of them have emphasized the mother-child relationship which exists between Earth and ourselves, and that nature is our greatest teacher. Although the Creator gave us each our own language, and we are very distinct in our cultures, we all believe that there is a mother-child relationship between the earth and ourselves. Because of this common belief, and having nature as our teacher, we share many of the same beliefs and values. Each of our cultures observed and studied the environment in which they live. From the knowledge that they gained, they developed a lifestyle which allowed them to live off the land and yet maintain harmony with nature. Much of the uniqueness of our cultures can be directly attributed to geographical location. The environmental differences controlled what resources were utilized for food, shelter, clothing, and other necessities. The environment also had a great influence on the knowledge base of the people and what beliefs and values they developed. Through their observations of nature, they learned that the circle is the most dominant form in nature. The sun is round. The moon is round. It was no surprise to our ancestors that they were told the earth is round. The birds' nests are round. The roots and the stems of the plants are round. Night follows day in a never-ending cycle. The seasons come and go, each one following the other like a great circle, beginning with spring, which marks the Indian New Year, followed by summer, fall, and winter. Life is a circle, it has no end. Young ones are born, grow up, grow old, and die. While more young ones are born to take the place of the old ones. Our ancestors came to understand the significance of the circle and built their homes so they were round like the things in nature, the wigwam, 
was made from a circle of poles which was covered with bark and so was the teepee which was covered with buffalo hides. They set their camps in a circle. Our ancestors developed a lifestyle that was harmonious with the nature cycle and the seasonal changes. In the spring, they hunted the ducks and geese as they returned from the winter homeland. Some continued to hunt ducks throughout the summer. In the late summer and fall, duck and goose hunting became a common activity once again. Duck eggs were gathered in the spring. Trapping was practiced to some degree by all our cultural groups. For some it was a principal activity and for others it was secondary. In the spring there was some trapping of fur-bearing animals, but it steadily decreased as the spring progressed. Muskrats were a popular cats during the season and once again in the fall. In the summer, trapping was not practiced. In late fall, the permanent winter trapline camps were set in place for those who primarily practiced trapping. The beaver was the most sought after of the fur-bearing animals. Beaver trapping was started in late fall and continued into the early spring. The season on secondary animals started in late fall as well. They included the weasel, squirrel, otter, fox, mink, marten, and lynx. The air and the jackrabbit were numerous and considered a staple part of the food supply. In the spring, the ice on the lakes and rivers would break so open water fishing was begun. While all of our ancestors did engage in fishing, those who lived on the plains would only fish to add to the variety of their diet. Some fished with hook and line, some with spears, and others used nets, while some built weirs. Spring is a season in which large animals bear their young. So the hunting of large game animals were limited to necessity during this season. Our ancestors did not believe in taking the life of a pregnant animal and that of a mother with a newborn. Selective hunting of large game continued into the summer. In late summer and early fall, the large communal hunts for buffalo were organized in the prairies. In the north, large communal hunts for caribou were initiated in the fall. Elk, moose, white-tailed deer, mule deer. The antelope were hunted in earnest during the fall. As the winter snow sets in, the hunting of large game became more difficult, so hunting usually went individually to pursue the game, often stalking the woods or prairies for days until they found an animal for the kill. Bear were hunted by some. The hunt for bear started in late summer and continued on to spring. This was also true of the porcupine. With the onset of spring, the plants begin to bud and soon burst forth with new growth. From spring to fall, our ancestors gathered many types of buds, leaves, roots, plants, berries, and nuts which were used for food and medicinal purposes. Among these were the wild turnip, the mint, sage, sweet grass, strawberry, Saskatoon berry, choke cherry, and blueberry. In the spring, sap from various trees was gathered and made into sugar and syrup. On the prairies, cattails were gathered for diapering babies, while in the north, Moss was gathered for diapering and women's hygiene. Some harvested wild rice in the fall. In the spring, the Soto and Dakota would plant crops of corn. Historically, nature determined the development, movement, and size of our camps. Our ancestors would determine the state of the environment by reading the plant and animal life. 
In the spring, summer, or fall, if it was found that the resources in a given area were not sufficient to sustain the people, they moved on to another area. In the winter or times of drought or other natural trauma, they adapted accordingly. Traditionally, the distribution and abundance of plant and animal life has affected the well-being of our people. The seasonal cycle governed the life of our people and emphasized the significance of the circle. Four is the most dominant number in nature. We have already acknowledged that there are four seasons. As well, there are four times of day. Sunrise, high noon, sunset, and night. There are four species of animals. The winged, those that walk on four legs, those that walk on two legs, and those that crawl. All plants go through four stages of growth. A stage of new growth, a blossoming stage, a stage in which it makes seeds, and death. There are four winds and four directions, west, north, east, and south. There are four stages in life, infancy, childhood, adulthood, and old age. These are but an example of the dominant presence of four in our natural environment. In their own way, each of our cultures acknowledge the significance of the number four in their daily lives. Our ancestors come to have an in-depth understanding of the significance of the number four and its interrelationship to the circle, each culture expressing this understanding in their own way. For the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota, this relationship is symbolized in the medicine wheel, which represents all of creation and has no beginning or end. Our ancestors could communicate with the animals. Our elders know this and tell us. And sometimes if a person is willing to listen, animals will come around and bring you a message. It might be a bird in the top of a tree, rabbits hopping by, or even a hunt. Even a prairie dog who popped his head out of this hole may have something to tell us. If these animals are not respected, like a buffalo, they may disappear from the earth. The Creator made the animals first so they could help prepare the earth for man, and they were told to sacrifice themselves so man may feed himself. Our ancestors knew this, and for this reason they always apologized to an animal when they took its life. Through their interaction with the animals, our ancestors came to understand that certain animals and birds have spiritual qualities and are messengers for the Creator. Among these are the buffalo, the bear, the wolf, the eagle, and the turtle. Each of our cultures had their own special relationship with these animals and others. They played a central role in the beliefs, oral tradition, and rituals of people and were acknowledged in prayers and songs. These animals, the number four, and the circle, today continue to be the significant symbols to our people. Often these symbols are incorporated into our arts. Our people adapted to their daily lives much of what they learned in their study of the animals. Our elders say that our child rearing practices, our hunting techniques, our dances, our songs, and our ways of interacting with one another were adopted from the animals. Through their intimate relationship with nature, our ancestors came to understand the true meaning of balance 
and the importance of maintaining balance within the environment. They learn there are consequences to bear if one becomes abusive of the environment or the animals. The consequence for abuse or greed could mean loss of life. Therefore, our people were very humble in their interaction with nature and thankful for what nature provided for them. Always conscientious and taking care not to offend or disturb the natural balance. At sunrise, prayers of thanksgiving were offered to the Creator, and again at sunset. Prayers of thanksgiving and offerings were always given when hunting, trapping, fishing, gathering, and as part of other daily activities. To be humble in your actions and thankful, give something in return for what you have received is nature's natural laws of circular interaction. This law has not only guided our people's interaction with nature, but had significant bearing on all our people's beliefs and values. Our people developed a very deep respect for nature, or an attitude of reverence for all living things. Life was seen as a gift, and all life forms were respected. No matter how small or insignificant they seemed, no life was taken without a purpose. Hunting, fishing, and trapping were not done for recreation, but for the survival of the people. All that was taken was used. Nothing was wasted. The quills of the porcupine, the hair of the moose, the bones of the elk, the duck's feathers, and even the hooves of the buffalo were used. In order for people to live together in harmony, they had to respect one another. The old were respected for their wisdom, and the young because they were the future. The uniqueness of individuals and nations was respected. People who could exercise self-discipline and demonstrated respect for the Creator and life in their daily activities and in their interaction with people were respected and honored. The gift of life was to be shared by all. Nations shared hunting territories. Traditionally, the alliances and conflicts which existed between our nations were not over animal and plant life issues. Our nation shared resources and products through trade. Within our camps, the workload was shared by men and women, young and old. The men took responsibility for hunting, fishing, and trapping protection of the camp, <coughs> care of the horses and dogs, production of tools and weapons, the political, judicial, and administrative needs of the camp, training the boys and young men, and most ceremonial activities. The women assumed responsibility for homemaking, including the construction of the home gathering firewood and water, cooking and keeping the home in order. The women had the prime responsibility for raising the children and teaching the girls and young women. The women gathered plants, berries and nuts for food and were responsible for food preparation and storage. They made the clothing for the family and all the household utensils, containers, and tools. They assisted the men with various ceremonies, provided the food, and conducted their own ceremonies. A man was not only expected to provide for his family, but for those who could not provide for themselves, such as the elderly, disabled, widows, and orphans. A person who could give generously and not count the cost was greatly admired and respected. To be called stingy 
was the worst insult. In some of our cultures, on important occasions, such as the birth of a child, naming, first hunt, success in battle, or death of a loved one, it was common practice for the person to have a giveaway. At the giveaway, the person would give away their possessions to the elderly, disabled, widowed, orphaned, and distinguished persons. Sometimes they gave away everything they owned. Within our cultures, the kinship bonds were very strong, and a camp would form a kinship unit, even if all the members were not related by blood. They supported one another in good times and in bad times. Whatever was done was done for the good of all. If one suffered, they all suffered. To live off the land required great courage because to face the forces of nature is not an easy task. Young children were taught by example and through stories the importance of bravery. It was important for a person to learn to face danger without running away and to face death with dignity. Any person who did something dangerous to protect another was honored and greatly respected. Although our traditional way of life is romanticized by many, in reality it was not an easy lifestyle. Our people often faced our race and other hardships. To maintain a positive attitude and practice self-control under the stressful conditions our people often found themselves in, it also required a tremendous amount of courage. The knowledge and wisdom of the elders was very important to the well-being of the people. Giving the information that they had passed on to them by their elders and their own personal experiences, they were in a position to advise the people. Some elders had special spiritual helpers who carried messages between them and the Creator. These elders were not necessarily old in age, but had wisdom. Advice from the elders was sought often. They were the magistrates and arbitrated all disputes. They were the teachers. They directed the ceremonial activities. Wisdom is understanding creation and knowing the relationship which exists between man and the Creator. Our people sought to gain wisdom and valued it more than material things. With wisdom, one understands the people are more important than material things. Wise people were humble and caring. People who had wisdom were highly respected and honored. The number of families which continue to live off the land is rapidly decreasing as a result of the destruction of the environment and federal and provincial policies which have been put in place to manage hunting, fishing, and trapping. Being forced off the land has had a significant effect on our people. Lifestyles are changing and it is influencing our people's beliefs and values. Our elders are very concerned and feel that the changes are affecting our cultures. The elders emphasize that our parent-child relationship with Mother Earth must be maintained and the law of circular interaction must be followed if the people and Mother Earth are to survive. To assure this, the elders stress that our languages, beliefs, and values must be taught in the schools. Our young people must be given an opportunity to learn from our greatest teacher, nature. <laughs>